Okay, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, good to see uh, those of you who are uh, coming back uh, again. For those of you for whom this is the first time or for whom don't remember uh, the rules of the game, let me explain you uh, a little bit how this is going to happen. First of all, very happy to welcome uh, Rima Hanna from Harvard University, who is our speaker today. Uh, and we're also um, uh, happy and, and lucky to have uh, Ben Olken, one of our co-authors with us uh, today, uh, who will uh, be answering uh, written questions uh, on, in, in, in the Q&A. So Rima will talk for 60 minutes. Uh, during those 60 minutes, if you have questions, write them in the Q&A. Uh, ben will answer some of them, also uh, flag some of them that uh, at a few points during the, the hour, um, we will uh, take the opportunity to ask uh, clarifying questions uh, to that, that uh, Rima can uh, answer, uh, clarifying all the questions for that matter, not just clarifying uh, during the hour. And then after the hour, we will uh, have a 15 minutes, uh, we'll open mics for people that want to uh, ask uh, further questions uh, for, for 15 minutes. Um, if you, uh, if there are questions in the Q&A that uh, you find uh, of particular interest, you can, you give them a thumbs up. Uh, so uh, we all know that those are uh, of, of more general interest. Now, there could be that there are questions that uh, we don't get to ask or we, we don't, uh, or we don't get to, don't, don't, you know, don't be upset about that. It, it could be because there's just too many questions, but it could also be because we know, uh, that the answer to those questions is going to come uh, on, on a few slides later, and, and, and so uh, we will remain hold off. Um, the, um, uh, let's see, what else do we need to say is that uh, we obviously will not uh, tolerate any abuse. Uh, uh, and the, uh, you know, we are all here to, to learn about this interesting work uh, and, 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 uh, and to talk about that and, and uh, together. The video of the talk will be um, listed on, uh, on, on the, on the VDEP uh, CPR uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so if there is other people you think may want to see this, uh, you can uh, point them uh, to that. And then uh, finally, I believe, uh, Rima, you will have a, a Zoom meeting open afterwards. Is that right? To do it? Yes. So Rima will be available uh, for further questions uh, after, the, after the seminars and will send to link uh, uh, for that uh, during during the talk. Um, I think we are probably, did I forget anything? Let me make sure that it doesn't look like it. Excellent, so then we can get started. So very happy to have you uh, with us, uh, Rima, and, and looking forward uh, to hearing, to learning from you. So, hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's, you know, it's really such an honor to be here today. I'm gonna be talking about uh, in-kind programs versus food stamps, um, describing a, a large scale experiment in Indonesia. And I should note this work is with a number of different people. So this work is joined with Abhijit Banerjee, who I think is here as well. Um, ben Olkin, who is on the chat, uh, if you have additional questions of MIT, Alan Satrian of UGM and Tan Peduaka, and Sudarno Samarto of Smeru and Tan Peduaka. Okay. so. Uh, in worldwide, food programs are an important part of how we think about any poverty strategies. And so, for example, last year, the World Food Program won the Nobel Prize for their efforts. And as an, really an acknowledgement by the international community about the importance of these kind of programs. Most of the programs typically fall into two kind of categories. The first is an in-kind program where you would deliver actual food to beneficiaries. And so there are examples of these around the world, including during the COVID crisis in the US. The US government, um, the USDA, had a farmers to families food box. The second kind is a voucher program. And the idea here is that you um, beneficiaries of the programs will receive either a coupon or a debit card in which they could go buy these food products on the, the private market. And again, these kind of programs also persist around the world. One of the most famous ones is the US Food Stamps Program or, or SNAP. So how do we think about the differences of these two different kind of programs? You know, on one hand, um, you know, you know, we might think that the results of these kind of programs should be very similar. You give somebody a loaf of bread um, or, you know, you give them money to buy a loaf of bread and in the end they have a loaf of bread. And so, you know, on, on, on one hand, um, you might not expect large differences. On the other hand, there are a number of different reasons why, um, starting from price theory, that economists typically think of these as different types of programs. 
So the first one is that the type of program could affect consumption decisions. So we often think of in-kind programs as paternalistic programs that depending on the underlying consumption of goods um, that someone is currently consuming, um, along with what you give and how much you give, it could constrain household choices in certain ways. And so, you know, oftentimes you hear, well, in-kind programs, they're going to improve nutrition, they're going to reduce the consumption of certain bads like alcohol and cigarettes relative to, you know, a more flexible, um, you know, voucher or cash type program. Second, um, we often um, think about the price effects of these programs the, and how they affect the private, um, the prices of, um, of, of, of these uh, private um, uh, food items in, in, um, in the market. So in-kind programs, we think about acting as um, a supply shock. And so they could bring down the price of goods and the goods that the poor typically consume, um, particularly in remote rural areas where the markets are really thin. Um, you know, in, in contrast, we might worry that um, with vouchers, uh, that might lead to an increase in demand for certain types of uh, food products. And again, particularly these kind of products that the poor might want, and that might raise the price for products that the poor consumes. Okay. A third difference between the two is that's often discussed in the literature is the self-targeting properties. So often we think of the, the kind of food that is distributed by the government in these in-kind programs as, you know, not as good as, you know, not as high quality as you're going to receive if you went to the grocery store. And as a result, we might think that the rich don't want them. And so therefore, um, uh, one argument for these in-kind programs relative to a more flexible voucher program, which the rich might be happy to have, is that you can actually um, get better targeting um, of the items to the poor if it's this lower quality in-kind program. Now, we are going to add another reason to the list, um, that another reason why these programs might differ is that in low capacity settings, the ability for the government to administer these programs on the ground as they're designed in theory might look very different depending on the type of program you choose. You know, for example, it might be much easier for the government to refill electronic vouchers each month rather than moving around millions and millions of tons of rice or other, which we're, we're going to be talking about, or other types of food products around the entire country. Um, and as a result, um, the government might have more control over the administration. You know, and for example, you know, as you're distributing food, it might just be easier for food to fall off the truck and disappear entirely or end up in the hands of households that are ineligible for the program rather than the targeted beneficiaries of the program. Uh, you know, in contrast, it might be easier to just do one big electronic transfer sitting you know, in some capital city, um, you know, making sure to refill all the electronic vouchers and getting more aid, to, uh, more aid uh, directly concentrated to the poor. Now, again, you know, there's lots of other issues at hand. It could be that getting these vouchers or debit cards to the poor in the first place might be really difficult, or we might think that you know, poor people might be unfamiliar with these banking products and it might be a challenge to use, um, which might also lead to their exclusion from the program. But you know, ultimately, all of these questions are you know, interesting theoretical questions that are, you know, um, uh, we can empirically answer. And so we're gonna study all of these questions in the context of a really rather, um, rather unique uh, large scale um, experiment that was conducted um, in Indonesia. Okay, so I am going to um, I'm going to go through the details of the programs and the details of the research design um, in a bit, but I want to give you a, first a higher overview of um, the, um, the the programs we study, um, and then also a higher overview of the results. So starting in 2018, Indonesia instituted an incredibly large scale multi year reform where they were switching the country's welfare programs from distributing an in-kind program that gave uh, beneficiary households 10 kgs of rice uh, uh, per month, um, directly giving them rice, to this new voucher program where you would get a digital uh, voucher and it was redeemable for rice or eggs at a private, you know, private agents throughout the country. Now, think about it this way. The eligibility rules for the program of who's eligible is not changing, but they simply how the mechanism for how you're getting your food aid is simply changing between the two regimes. And so in terms of implementing this reform, it was going to take several years. And so for the 2018-2019 um, 
um, uh, changeover, um, about 105 districts were going to be switched over over those two years. Um, and so the government of Indonesia randomized um, the timing of when those districts switched over. And so this is just to give you a sense of the scope of this. This is about 20% of Indonesia, about 53 million people potentially affected um, by this uh, experiment. Um, and so because of the scale, it really allows us to answer a lot of the questions that I talked about before, including, you know, measuring the general equilibrium effects on prices, you know, all the, while it's a national program administration, it's done, you know, through the districts. And so really studying um, the administration of these programs and, and having a large enough sample um, and uh, to be able to even uh, look at uh, uh, look at effects on, on poverty in, in a very real world setting in a real um, in, in a very in in the real functioning of a program. Okay. Now, um, as again, as I said, I'm going to give lots and lots of details about all of this in a bit. Um, but just to to give you uh, um, where we are, um, we to analyze the the change um, that occurred because of the reform. We use the National Sample Survey of Indonesia, including additional modules that we added in specifically for the evaluation. Um, and we also merge this with all the administrative data of the program. So including all the underlying architecture that goes into the targeting system of who becomes a beneficiary, as well as um, the, um, the uh, well as collecting data, for example, on the relative costs of these different programs. And then we're going to use this to evaluate the effect of the program type on the aid received, on um, does it have effects on, on poverty, on consumption patterns, on food prices, and the overall program leakage. Okay. Um, as I said, I, I'm just going to, you know, it, so you have it in the back of your mind as we're going through the, the details of the, um, the details of the, uh, the reform and also the empirical strategy. I'm just going to give you a very high level sense of the results we find. So first of all, we find a very um, substantial change in how the, the allocation of aid, so how the aid was allocated to households. So in the voucher areas, the aid was much more concentrated to targeted households than to households that were likely ineligible for the program. And so in fact, you see that targeted households received in total 45% more aid um, than um, those house, the equivalent households in the in-kind areas. Now there's different, um, they, we could then try to decompose this to where this increase in aid is coming from. So first of all, we show that this aid is not just driven by program leakage. So it's not driven by a reduction in the amount of rice or, or food aid that has gone missing. But rather what we're finding is that in the in-kind areas, um, the, the, the aid is distributed to many different households, including a lot of households that are ineligible for the program. Whereas the vouchers get directly aid, directly concentrated at um, the targeted households in the, in the voucher areas. And so what we're really seeing that it's less about the overall pie being bigger, but more about the change in who's receiving the aid. And so if I'm a household that actually then received my voucher, I receive 84% more in subsidy than those who are receiving the in-kind aid in the in-kind areas. Now, importantly, it's kind of interesting, despite not only am I um, receiving more aid, the aid is of much higher, the rice is of much higher quality. Um, and so this idea that, you know, the, the bad quality, uh, um, you know, if it's going to be a good quality product, um, the rich are going to come in and take it all is not necessarily true. And in fact, the administrative ability of concentrating the aid to poor households means that they both get more aid and they get higher quality aid. Now, the next question that comes is we're making a substantial, really big substantial change in who receives welfare, um, because we're actually, you know, um, you know, switching the, the district, uh, basically concentrating aid to these targeted households. So the next thing we do is we say, does this have real effects on well-being? And so um, we, uh, we look at poverty rates and, and what we find is actually, you know, and I'll go through more measures and, and discussion as, as we get into it, but we find pretty remarkable effects that um, in the voucher areas um, for very, uh, for the, the households, the uh, poor households, uh, those in the bottom 15% of the wealth distribution at baseline poverty fell by about 20%. So um, going through some of the other results, you know, first um, looking at the change in the type of food consumed. So first of all, as I mentioned, first of all, you find that households are receiving much more higher quality rice. 
the second um, uh, the second is to ask, uh, is it changing the consumption of other uh, products in their food basket? Now, first of all, I should note that in Indonesia, um, rice is a really big part of the diet. Everybody's eating way more rice than they would ever receive in the program. So we wouldn't expect huge um, effects on, on rice eating. And in fact, we don't, we don't see huge effects on the total consumption of rice. But what's really interesting is that we find an increase in egg consumption in the, in the proteins that households receive from eggs. Um, but we don't find any effects on other different types of food items. So it's not that suddenly, um, you, you know, you get this additional income, you get more of the subsidized eggs, and so you, you buy less of private eggs. But it is, is actually shifting um, households towards this consumption of the higher protein eggs. And so as a result, it's basically um, saying that there is some, uh, the labeling effect of the vouchers in terms of changing consumption patterns. Okay. Next, um, we look at the general equilibrium effect on rice prices. Um, and you know, here, the first thing we do is we look at what is the total effect on rice prices, and you know, it, we we don't find um, we don't find any significant effects. The next thing we do is we look at really remote areas, so areas you know in the 75th percentile of you know time away from district capital. We find some modest effects there, although they're not large enough to undo the benefits of the program as a whole. So and I'll, I'll get more into that in a bit. And then finally, I should note, um, you know, because, you know, we, we care not only about program benefits, we also care about the cost of programs. And so what we do is we, um, we, uh, we you know, um, got the, the administrative cost of um, running both types of programs to the government. And what we find is, first of all, is kind of interesting is that uh, the administrative costs are not large as a percentage of the benefits given out, um, but they're actually much, much smaller in the voucher based program. Um, again, depending on how you count like bank, the underlying banking infrastructure and what's for the program and for the private market and, and so forth. But, so basically, in the end, what we're finding is that this change from the in kind distribution to the vouchers led to a concentration of, of aid towards poorer households that led to a poverty reduction and at a lower cost. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna be doing, um, and I'm gonna try to keep a track of, a track of time. Oh my God, I, like more time has gone by than I thought. So what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna tell you a little bit more details about the particular setting the experimental design and the data. Then I'm gonna go through these results in detail. And I'm first gonna talk about the, the social assistance, who's receiving what and um, who's receiving red and how much. We're gonna go through the poverty results and then I'll go through all of these other, the consumption decisions, the effects on rice prices, leakages and program costs. Um, and again, I should note, um, just a reminder that Ben is on the chat and if there are other questions um, that come up, you know, do let us, do let us know. Okay, so starting off with this setting, um, the experimental design um, and the experimental design and the data. So to start, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background of um, the food uh, distribution, uh, food assistance program in Indonesia. So the Indonesia's Rastra program, which is the in-kind program, uh, began in the late 90s during the Asian financial crisis. It's had slight modifications over the years, but basically it is basically giving out uh, rice um, to poor households. And I'll describe more of the details of that in a bit. It is Indonesia's largest welfare program. It's about $1.5 billion a year. The program is um, designed, as I said, to give um, households 10 um, kgs of free rice per month. It's um, about 15 million households are targeted. So it's a, it's a pretty extensive program. The value of the program is about $8 a month. Of course, you know, that's going to depend on, you know, um, uh, changes in the price of rice. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it's on average, it's, it's pretty substantial. So if you think of a family um, below the poverty line, it's about 6.5% of consumption. Okay. So to become eligible for the program, it's, um, the eligibility is determined through proxy means tests. Uh, the last time the proxy means test had been done was uh, 2015. Um, the, this is basically uh, collecting um, assets through an asset census uh, and giving people a poverty score. And if you're below, you're likely eligible. 
The villages were allowed to make some changes to the list at that time and sub uh, submit them to the district. The lists were finalized and lists are given from the, the districts to all the villages of here is the list of the eligible households for this program. The rice then is procured um, by the government logistics agency um, called Bulag. Um, they uh, uh, deliver the rice to, um, to either district or sub-district warehouses. The rice is you know, picked up uh, by villages. And then the village government is um, supposed to, you can see these very like large sacks of rice. The village government is supposed to then subdivide them and distribute them to beneficiaries that are on the list. Now we know that um, you know, from previous research um, that has been done, um, there are a lot of challenges in this program. So first, a, a lot of, as I said, a lot of rice just goes missing, falls off the truck. We don't know where it goes. Um, and then second, another big problem is that the rice is also, um, is often ends up in the hand of households that should not be eligible for the program. And so as a result, that households that are eligible receive a lot less than their intended subsidy from the government. So, um, you know, several years ago, the Indonesian government decided to switch from uh, the in-kind program to this voucher-based program. And I should note, you know, this is the largest reform that was done to the welfare programs over the last 20 years. And so it's a really um, a, a huge undertaking, um, a huge undertaking in the way aid is being distributed to the poor. And so the change here is that um, households would now in the voucher program, the same targeted households, instead of being eligible for the rice distribution would now be eligible for a monthly voucher of about 110,000 uh, rupiah a month. It was now redeemable for rice or for eggs. Um, it's, it's savable in principle and not, but not really encouraged. And it was supposed to be used to buy goods. You, you're, not being, you're not supposed to use it to cash it out. Um, and as I said, it's the same uh, eligibility um, as Rastra, because all of the, the data to determine the targeting and all of this was done before any of these reforms happened. And it's really just a change in how you're receiving um, your food aid. The administration of the program was done through debit cards. And so you can see the, I, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but you can see the debit card, um, which is issued to a female adult member in the household. Uh, the banks were, uh, there's a series of four different banks, um, depending on the area you lived in, that would be issuing the cards. Um, and then they would be redeemable for purchase at this network of bank agents. So just to give you a sense here, of who are the bank agents? Um, this is, uh, you can see in the picture, this is a typical bank agent. It's a small shop. You know, there is the, the poster for the BPNT program, you know, letting people know that this is a shop um, that has one of these EDC machines and therefore is a designated agent of the program. And the idea was that, um, the idea is that to make sure that there's enough agents such that, you know, poor people can actually, uh, you know, the people in the program, the beneficiaries can actually receive um, receive their uh, intended subsidy. And so the government put in place a regulation that there needed to be one agent for 250 beneficiaries, a minimum of two agents per village. Um, and you know, by March 2019, in our treatment areas, there were about 9,000 agents um, using the administrative bank data. And what we found is one agent for about 135 beneficiaries on average. So there's lots of different places for the beneficiaries to go, um, or there's, a, the agents are, um, are available for eight, for beneficiaries to, to go um, pick up their subsidy. Um, the 99, I should note two other things. One, the, the agents themselves, 99 of them are private bank agents, um, are private shops. Um, it could be a government shop as well, deciding to, um, uh, to, to also administer the program, but most of them are, are, are private, are, are little private shops such as this. And then the agents themselves, um, can buy rice and eggs wholesale from the open market, although there was some pressure to still buy rice from the logistics agency. And so in some cases you did see that. Okay. So the program, um, as I said, the reform was gonna happen over a number of years because they need to convert, um, convert districts um, from you know doing the rice distribution to you know distributing um, the the bank cards and setting up the infrastructure to to run the voucher program, 
And so in 2017, it began as a pilot in 44 cities. Then in 2018, 2019, um, the, uh, in the budget, it was allocated to, um, for about 10 million um, new beneficiary households were gonna be converted into the voucher program. So what did this mean? So how do you get the 10 mil, uh, these 10 million? So some of them were coming from some purposely chosen districts, mostly um, in East Java for political reasons. Um, but then there are about a hundred um, and uh, five districts where the government proposed randomizing the timing of when um, they would receive the program. So for those in um, this uh, 2018 to 2019 period, um, we, um, what we did is we had a sample of 105 districts, 42 of them were allocated to the voucher program in 2018, 63 to the in-kind program, and then were converted in 2019. And then even within the voucher program, they were done um, you know, at different times of the year. So in three different phases, and I'll talk um, more about that in a bit. Um, the, I should note that um, you know, this, um, we, you know, so Indonesia is a series of islands. <laughs> um, and so we stratify by island group um, for additional power, but we had this one constraint that the government needed to come to 10 million beneficiaries because that is what was allocated in the budget to convert to this new program this year. So what we did is we had took the smallest 20 districts out of this 105 and we put them into a special strata we randomized the order of them and we treated until we hit the 8.3 million plus you know, uh, 1.7 from those purposely chosen districts in a different sample. Um, and so what we'll also do is um, because uh, if you're in that special stratum, you have a different probability into treatment. We use strata fixed effects everywhere. We also ran all the results dropping that special strata and we find exactly identical results. Okay. Um, Oh, and then I should note that the control districts ended up getting treated, as I said, in, you know, in the middle of the year in 2019, or starting then. Okay. Seema, so just here, a, oh yeah. A moment to ask some of the, the more general questions that came up. Yeah. Uh, one from Alessandra Tarozzi uh, on kind of what, what is the experiment measuring in terms of the mechanism? So is it, it seems like it's more than just the, the voucher versus in kind, because it's also the supply uh, mechanism that is different and kind of if we go back to your original set of questions uh, and motivation for this how do we how do you want to think about that and then a related question is on um, an argument that kind of people make that kind of in, in India um, sorry I don't have the, the, the mm -hmm. person who asked the question here is is uh, is that in-kind transfers help uh, as an insurance against price mm -hmm. increase and so yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you have variation or uh, causes something to look at, or is there kind of an external validity yeah. question if there was no prices increases in, or important price increases in this particular year? No, I think those are both really good questions. I think the way I think about this is that it's a switch of the program, you know, as a, we're not, um, we're not just changing whether or not I'm giving you you know, food aid versus, you know, giving or a voucher, I'm looking at the overall effect of what happens when the government switches over, including these administrative aspects, which might also change who's receiving the program. And in fact, that turns out to be an important part of the story. And so I, I view it as a whole of a the switch of what was going to happen if you run these programs in, in um, it, it, for real in the real world, including Including the, um, including, and in fact, actually, as I said, I, I really do think that the story, as you'll see, is really coming from the, the administrative capabilities around this program and then how it affects um, what households ultimately receive. On the second question, that's a really interesting question. And so um, I thought about this a lot. So, first of all, if you look at rice prices in Indonesia, they're pretty stable over the years. And so you're not seeing really big differences. And so I don't think you're seeing um, the same as, as you saw in the paper in India, where um, is providing much more of an insurance mechanism. I think the other thing that's interesting is that one nice thing about the fact that these are digital vouchers is that the government can also, if there are, if there are shocks, uh, economic shocks, the government can increase the voucher amount. So, for example, in the COVID crisis, and again, this is after our sample, um, the gov one of the things that the government did was increase the amount on um, uh, on the voucher. 
Um, it, they doubled the amount of the voucher during the COVID crisis. Now, of course, again, that gets into you know all of these political issues and automatic stabilizers and all of these you know other debates that other countries have. But I don't think um, you know given what rice prices look in Indonesia, the insurance issue is as much of a story here as it would be in India. And then there's a question by from Jenny Aker on, on also related to the mechanism. So she's asking whether the number of agents is correlated with the voucher program or is it the existing shopkeepers that are able to become agents uh, and then the density of shops would stay stable? No, this is also a good question. So there are, so it's, it's a combination of both. So first of all, there were existing shops um, and some, to be an agent, you needed the EDC machine. And as you rent the EDC machine each month. And so there were, um, there were agents already in these areas that had the EDC machines and were able to then run the program. But one thing that we also find in, in a different paper that we're, we're working on looking at sort of what was happening with financial inclusion as, as a result of this program, one of the things we looked at is, do we see new agents arising? Um, and, and indeed, with when the voucher programs and we see new agents arising, my best guess is it's, it's mostly existing shops that get EDC machines because there was a big push to try to make sure that there were enough um, there were enough agents out there for beneficiaries to receive their subsidy and that they wouldn't have to travel very far to get it. Okay, great. I'll let you continue. Okay. Okay, so where I say, okay, so, ah, okay. So um, this is a map of Indonesia um, with Indonesia's, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge country <laughs> and it's got many, many islands. And as you can see, because we built um, the experiment into the, the policy rollout and it was being done across the entire country, you know, we've got, you know, the, I guess the blue is the voucher and I guess the green is the in-kind, you know, our sample, it, like our, you know, the, the treatment and control districts are spread across the entire country. And so one challenge is how do you um, collect the data to evaluate this? Um, you know, it would be extremely, extremely costly for me to run surveys in these 105 districts across the country that were, um, you know, uh, representative and so forth. And so, um, we, um, we ended up um, trying to make use of the government systems of data collection as well. And so uh, uh, there are several different forms of data that we use. So first of all, we used for our key outcome data, we use the Indonesian SUSANAS. So the SUSANAS is the National Sample Survey of Indonesia. It's a repeated cross-section, about 250,000 households. Um, per year. And there's a, there's a smaller wave in September, and then in March, it's the much bigger wave. And we use two forms of data from the SUSANAS. First, the government does a very detailed consumption module. And so from that, we know, you know the overall household you know, per capita consumption, but we also know um, information about rice consumption, rice prices, um, you know, egg consumption. Now, second, we wanted to um, get questions about the program. We wanted to know, did you receive the program? How much did you receive? What was the quality of the program? And so we worked with, um, we worked with the government um, of Indonesia. We worked with, um, you know, with the planning ministry and the, and the census bureau to add in a module on the social protection programs. Um, and so um, this module uh, that we designed uh, ran in March, 2018, which is our baseline, um, the smaller September 2018 uh, SUSNS and then the, the March, which is the, our big end line um, data. Okay, so from that we have a lot of our outcome data, but we also wanted to know, well, out of the, you know, we, out of the people in the SUSNS, um, who is likely eligible for the program and who is likely ineligible for the program. So we wanted to know who the beneficiaries of the program are. So one thing that we uh, realized was that the SUSNAS has the national ID number, um, collects the national ID number. Um, and so um, the government, uh, we worked um, with the government, uh, actually the government did the matching where they matched the SUSNAS to the 2015 targeting database which is the underlying architecture of eligibility. So this is the proxy means test where they collect a census of households and it has all of the data on you know, household consumption and assets and, and the proxy means test score. Now, this data is great for two reasons. One, it tells us who's eligible or likely eligible for the program. And two, it's also nice because the SUSNAS is a cross-section. It's also giving us baseline data on these households. So we know their baseline, um, where they fall in the baseline asset distribution. Okay. And then the third is, so the SUSNAS, in addition to have national ID numbers, it also has the village you live in. 
And Indonesia, um, Indonesia has really great data. If people are interested in working in Indonesia, it's wonderful data. Um, it has um, every three years, it conducts a village level census where it collects data on every village um, across the nation. And so we also merged in the village level census. And so this gives us a village level baseline characteristics, but then also some outcomes in the villages that, um, that I'll talk about in a bit. Okay. So um, just to give you a sense of the timeline, um, there was the, the baseline SUSANAS in March, 2018, you know, that households are, are treated um, over, are, are, over time. Um, and then we have our end line before the control um, the control uh, districts were treated. Okay, so um, next, um, in terms of the analysis, all my analysis is, um, you know, going to, uh, you know, look uh, fairly standard. It's, it's a randomized control trial, so we're looking at various outcomes, which I'll talk about in a bit, and we're comparing whether or not um, you're in a, a um, a district that has the in-kind distribution or was switched over to the voucher. Um, and I should note that all of our treatment districts got switched over to the vouchers at their appointed times. There were three control districts that were in kind that got switched over, but we're, you know, given that there were so few, we're basically looking at the intent to treat. We also, um, we include strata fixed effects um, that, uh, as I had talked about the randomization, um, and then we chose um, household control variables using a double lasso that's coming from, uh, you know, baseline, um, the, the individual household characteristics merged in from the targeting database, the village level covariates, some district level covariates from the baseline SUSANAS. But I should note that this, um, we also show in, you know, the appendix that, you know, you, the control variables don't really affect the results. Okay. So um, uh, just uh, going through some of the other technical details, we, you know, stand, we randomize at the district level. So standard errors are clustered by the district and we focus on the randomization inference p-values. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the March 2019 SUSANAS. You know, this is, first of all, this is the bigger SUSANAS with more of the sample, but this is also after all of the treatment districts got treated. So only 10 um, got treated before September. But I should know that if you look at the September, the results look remarkably similar. Um, and, or if you look at the pool, they also look at the same. And that's also all in our appendix. And then finally, um, I should note, we pre-specified that we would split households based on the underlying targeting uh, database. So the, uh, the program is supposed to target the bottom 30%. So anyone with a percentile score below 30, um, we have as likely eligible for the program. Anyone who has a PMT score above or who was never um, PMT because they were deemed too wealthy to, is seen as um, you know, likely ineligible for the program. But because we also have the detailed PMT score, we also look at a variety of other different poverty lines. So for example, um, you know, it's about the PMT score of about 10 is the $1 per day. We look at um, also you know, five and 15 um, as well. Okay, so how am I? Uh, okay, on time. Okay, so um, I think I've got 20 minutes left. Okay, so I'm going to next talk about the findings. I'm going to talk about, first, I'm going to talk about how much aid are people receiving and who is actually receiving the aid. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the impacts on poverty. And then I'll talk about the consumption decisions and prices and, and leakages and the, the overall cost of the program. Okay, so starting with who receives assistance how, and how much, I'm going to start by looking at the total amount of subsidy um, the group received. So the total amount of subsidy those below 30 received versus those above. And then I'm going to decompose it into different pieces of whether or not you receive subsidy at all and also um, how much you actually received. Okay. So um, to start, here is um, on the table, this is, you know, the coefficient on the voucher. Um, you know, here is the total subsidy and I've circled, there is the PMT below 30 and the PMT above 30. Um, and so the first thing you could see um, very starkly, if you're below 30, um, you see the 45% increase in the amount of total subsidy um, your group is receiving, um, and it, it's statistically significant. I mean, you see a corresponding 28% uh, decrease in the subsidy for those um, above the 30th percentile. Um, just going here, um, taking a look at this graphically, 
I've graphed out, here's, again, that's the same outcome, the average subsidy receives. But now instead of just looking at below and above 30, I'm looking at this by um, PMT score bins of five. So this is five, 10, 15, and so forth. And what you can see is, um, you know, here is, um, hopefully you can see my mouse, is, um, you know, uh, roughly below 30. So this is uh, roughly um, the, the eligible population. And what you see is, is um, you know, the voucher, the blue is above the green. So they're receiving a lot more. Um, and you can see it's actually very concentrated in the bottom of the distribution for um, people at five and 10 are, are receiving much more in subsidy um, than the, the gains you see at someone at you know, 20. Um, and then uh, it flips. And so then again, you see people who are um, you know, uh, too rich to be PMT'd, um, they received more in in-kind and now they're receiving less under voucher. So it's switching the distribution of who receives the total subsidy. Okay. So now, as I said, I can decompose it into two different um, factors. Do I receive the subsidy, do any of the subsidy amounts? And then if so, how much subsidy I receive? And so first I look at receiving subsidy and you, here is also the group for, for everybody, regardless of your PMT score. And the first thing you'll notice is that number is negative. So less people are receiving the program as a whole. Um, you, this is, um, you know, this is, there is both more exclusion error and more inclusion error on, uh, in, um, in both of these groups. And so if I'm also below 30, I'm about 16% less likely to receive any subsidy. If I am above 30, I'm about 50% less likely to receive subsidy. So just going graphically again, you see it everywhere um, that, you know, again, the green is the end kind and the blue is the, um, the blue is the voucher. I um, mean, again, here are the PMT score bins. And what you see is the green is always above the blue. So less people are always receiving the program at every PMT score, although it's much smaller um, for those who are at the bottom of the distribution than um, who are at the top. And so we've done a lot more other work to try to understand, you know, for those below 30, who are the people who are no longer receiving the program? And what we're, if you look at, um, if you look at the consumption data, what you're seeing, it's the richer of the poor. So it's moving it. Um, so as a whole, the program is moving it from people who have higher consumption to lower consumption. But there is, again, I should note, there is an increase in exclusion error. OK. But what does this mean? So this is basically saying it's shifting. It's less people as a whole are receiving the subsidy. Um, but what ends up happening is if I am somebody who um, receives a subsidy, I receive a lot more. So I'm receiving 84% more in subsidy. Um, than I did before. And where is this coming from? So again, now here I'm graphing out um, the, the distribution of amounts people receive. Um, and so these are households that are below 30. And here is the percent of households that fall into these groups. You know, again, the green is the in kind and the blue is the voucher. And oh, I should have noted the total subsidy variable is the average is, is over the, the average over the last four months. And so the first thing you, you note is that there are spikes of, you know, this is, I received all four months. Um, this is, I received three months, the total amount, I received two months. So it's basically, whereas in the in-kind, um, you know, people are receiving much smaller amounts. And so what's basically happening is that if you get it, you're much more likely to receive the full amount you're supposed to get, and that's really driving this. Um, and again, I'm if I graph it out conditional on receipt, just to look at this a little bit more closely, you really do see, um, you really do see the spikes. So, um, you know, one thing that comes up is that, you know, again, you know, there is an increase in inclusion. Uh, there's an increase, um, you know, there is, some people are more likely to be excluded from the program now. Um, and so one thing that might come up is that, well, not only are those, those individuals who are richer, but also how does that affect um, social discord in the village? And so we looked at a number of different variables. And so we looked at whether or not using the village level census, we looked at whether or not um, there was a protest in your village um, regarding public services, whether or not there is a complaint that there's more corruption, or whether or not the village head turned over. So you might blame your village head, you know, if, if you no longer receive the program. And we really just don't find um, uh, that much going on here in terms of, of the social outcomes. Okay. Going back um, to that original table, the final thing I want to note is the quality of the rice. 
So you know, rash or rice is notoriously bad. Um, I think what ends up happening is, you know, the government picks up the rice. They don't have an incentive to really treat it well. And it ends up in these warehouses that are kind of dusty and the rice gets broken in like the truck along the way and it has stones in it and it gets very dirty. Um, and so the, and uh, people are always complaining about the rice, but at the same time, the argument is always made that, well, this has really important self-targeting properties because the rich don't want this really bad rice and the poor do. But we find actually the opposite, that when you ask households um, to rank the quality of the rice they receive, um, the rice they receive um, you know, from these agents in the in-kind um, areas are actually much higher. So what you're actually finding is not that you know, bad rice is having um, self-targeting properties, but actually under the vouchers, um, more of the aid is going to the poor um, and it's higher quality. Okay. So the next question um, we have is, you know, this is really changing, you know, who's receiving aid. It, it is really having massive effects on who's receiving aid and it's really changing the amount that I as a welfare beneficiary would receive if I, if I do receive the aid. And so the question is, is it having an effect on poverty? And so in, um, in Indonesia, the, the, as I said, the, the poverty line is the $1 per day is about the 10th percentile. But remember, this is targeted towards um, the 30th and below. Um, so the next thing um, we're going to do is, and, and this is, a, you know, the program accounts for about, you know, 7% of the poverty line. So it could have a meaningful effect. So the next thing I'm going to do is look at effects on poverty. Um, and so I'm going to start with the graph and then we'll go to the table. Again, I graphed out the bin score, the PMT people by the, um, the PMT scores in bins of five. So you can see them at the bottom. Um, and then just to make it easier, I put in um, the, the marks for the poverty lines. Um, and you know, so here, for example, is uh, the probability that you fall below the poverty line. You know, here is um, you know, if you're at a PMT score of in a bin around five. Um, you can see here is the end kind and here is a voucher. You see a, a large reduction in the poverty rate. Um, it is there um, for you know, 5, 10, 15, um, and then gets smaller as people get richer. And it's important to note that these are both the households that are more likely to be below the poverty line, but also if you remember my previous graph, so they're the ones who are receiving much larger amounts of subsidy. Um, so going to the table, um, if you look at all households, um, you know, it's, you, everyone, regardless of PMT score, you see, you know, over a 10 percentage point, you see one percentage point, but with a p-value of 0.2. Um, as you go further down um, to the households that are, are um, uh, households, uh, you know, below, these are the households that are supposed to be receiving the program. Um, you see a reduction of two percentage points over 18. If you go to households, you know, the bottom 15%, you see a four percentage point over, you know, 21 percentage point, a 20% different reduction in poverty. Um, and you see pretty um, larger effects as you get down to those who are even at the, um, the lower end of the wealth distribution. Um, and I should note, you know, we won't have time for this, but in the paper, we look at you know, we look at consumption, we look at the poverty gap, we look at the poverty gap squared, we look at lots of different metrics of poverty and we find very consistent results across all of this that basically the, the bottom of the bottom are really being helped by the program. Okay. So, okay, so, ooh. <laughs> I want to ask a question that's oh, been happening for a while. Uh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Waiting for, to, for you to get to the poverty number. So it's, it's a question from uh, Anna Thompson. Mm -hmm. on the developing implications. And so she's asking, she's linking it with your other work on targeting. So she's asking mm -hmm. on, on whether the, the, the findings on poverty, whether you have an intuition on whether they depend on the targeting process, this using the PMT, but as opposed to kind of using a community targeting process. And I guess the, the, the related yeah. question to that is that given that you use the PMT, I mean, you know that's not perfect. And so do yeah. you have a sense of to what extent some of these results may look different with, with, a, with an independent uh, poverty measure? No, I think this is a good question. So I didn't show the results here, but we also showed it. Well, there's two things. There's, um, uh, there's two things. There's the underlying PMT process in terms of choosing beneficiaries. And, and I do agree, you know, some of this is going to depend on, 
what what it's basically telling me is that it, uh, the program is allowing me to match who is targeted, and of course, the tar the targeting the who is targeting depends on the underlying system you use. So that's the first one. On the second one, I don't think these particular these particular poverty results. We also wanted to make sure that it, you know we know that there's errors in the PMT, so we also looked at it based on your um, your consumption and find consumption distribution, and we find very similar results. So I don't think these particular poverty results are really um, affected by the fact that we're using the PMT. It's just cleaner because the, the, the PMT is a very nice baseline measure for us. Okay. But I think that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. A somewhat related question by uh, Jeffrey Weaver on the exclusion restriction. I think you may have answered this, but, but, but let me double check. So he's asking whether some of the early results, could there be an unfamiliarity on the, with the debit cards and people learning about them? And so is there a dynamic in, in the results uh, if you look over time? You know, this is a really good question. We also, I, unfortunately, I didn't have time to like show everything. But one thing that we did is we take the March results, but we look at, we have the different phases. So we know that you were in the, you were in the, the first 10 districts in phase one, phase two, phase three. And so those are throughout the year. And we do see um, a bigger effects for those who are in the earlier phase, so in phase one in March, as opposed to those who are in phase three in March. So it's telling us that if anything, the results over time are likely to improve as people get more used to the systems. Um, you know, again, it's, uh, so it's, you know, I would love to have a, a, a much longer time period than that, and, and maybe I will uh, as time progresses, but even just within that year, you do see some learning. Okay, great. I'll let you, because I think more is coming. There's further questions, but I'll let you first. Uh, oh yeah, no, these are good questions. Oh my God, and I have what? I have nine minutes left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so just to, um, you know, I'm going to uh, um, uh, skip over some of this, but basically, as we said, that, you know, you do see a very different allocation in age. You do see, um, you know, a lot of this is being driven by, you know, uh, those who are, uh, you know, richer households being much like likely to get it, although you do see some increases in exclusion error as well. And so that's important to note as you're thinking about what's happening here. But on net, what you're finding is overall um, overall poverty reduction. And, and this, I really think, is coming from these administrative um, improvements rather than some of these, you know, self-targeting properties that people talk about about the race. So then um, I'm probably given I have um, nine minutes, eight minutes, <laughs> I might go through these a bit more quickly. I'm going to talk about do the vouchers change food behaviors? Do they shift um, food prices? Um, uh, you know, looking at these general equilibrium effects on food prices, is this driven by leakages? Um, and then the relative cost of the program. So, um, so first, uh, you know, the the vouchers are giving you more flexibility because, first of all, they allow you to buy rice and eggs as opposed to just getting um, uh, getting rice. Um, the first, so we're going to look at consumption patterns with regard to both. So, first of all, I should note that um, the first thing we're going to say is look at whether or not we expect this to have an effect on um, rice consumption. And so, the first thing I should note, okay, so here I've graphed out. Here's the first graph um, over here. Here's rice consumption. Um, these are all households in the in-kind area. These are the percent of households consuming this many kgs of rice. I put in the amount, and these are in the in-kind area. So people receiving the program, I put in, you know, this is the, uh, the 10 that you're getting in the program. And the first thing you'll notice is that the green mass is over here, that basically everybody is consuming much more rice than you're receiving in the program. And this is true even if I limit it to those below PMT, um, PMT score of 30. Um, and as you can see, even like the poorest of the poor, so those in the PMT score bin of five are also consuming way more rice. So we shouldn't expect there to be a mechanical effect on rice consumption. And so, okay, so then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you two tables. One is on the amount of subsidized food products you receive, and then two, your total consumption. So in terms of the subsidized um, consumption, um, we don't see, a, a huge, we don't see an effect on the total amount of subsidized rice the households are getting, but they're receiving way more in total subsidy. Where is that coming from? It's coming from the eggs. Um, and as you can see, it went from like basically no subsidized eggs to a huge amount. And, and then you see a reduction for those above because they're receiving less of the subsidy. Okay, so then how is that translating to the total consumption of the household? Um, the first, you know, column two, is giving you total rice for those who are likely eligible. Um, and what you're seeing is no difference um, in rice consumption there, or even for those who are ineligible for the program. It's basically not moving 
your consumption of rice, because as I said, everybody is consuming a lot, lot more rice than they would have received under the program. But what's interesting is that you do see an increase in total egg protein that the household is consuming, um, and a, a pretty big effect. And it's about a third relative to the, the subsidized amount you're getting. Um, so the question is, is this, a, is this an income effect or is, is you know, are, are households now buying eggs as opposed to other products? So the next thing we could do is look at a large number of other products that households consume. That, uh, that poor households, typic, uh, these, these kind of households are a typical consumption basket. What you find is we, we're not seeing a change in consumption across other um, other goods. Um, and then, you know, I put in, uh, you know, everyone likes to see liquor and cigarettes, and you're also seeing no difference here as well. And so for me, what this is suggesting is, you know, the households could have adjusted and gotten more subsidized eggs and bought less eggs and bought more of lots of other different food products. But what's interesting about the vouchers themselves being labeled towards eggs is actually uh, affecting real consumption decisions in terms of um, you know, protein choices that households are making. Okay. Next, um, prices. So, you know, this is, uh, so, okay, so next we want to look at, you know, one of the, you know, the big, um, you know, questions I've talked about before is that, you know, we think about, um, we think about uh, the, um, you know, the, the in-kind programs or, you know, supply shock of rice, we think this lowers um, the price. And so with the vouchers, you might expect prices to increase. Um, so we're going to look at this in aggregate. But then we also look at two particular types of districts. So uh, our districts or villages. So first of all, if there is going to be price effects, we would expect them to be largest in areas where subsidized rice is a larger share of the total rice consumed. And so we're going to be able to look at districts that are, you know, a high, um, high subsidized rice versus low subsidized rice. The other thing, um, you know, you might want to uh, look at is areas where um, you, there's not a lot of rice in the private market, the private market's not very thick, they're very isolated areas. I um, mean, so here, um, we can do it through villages uh, for, at the village level, and we can look at if the prices are increases in, in villages that are more isolated. Um, okay, although I should note for you, though, that you know, I wanted to note, sorry, I meant to note that one thing to keep in mind is that the you know, rice is one of the most, as I said, people eat a lot of rice. It's one of the most single important commodities in the country. It's not something which is usually in short supply. Um, so we might not expect huge results because of that. Okay. So here again, I have this table. Um, you know, here is the voucher. Um, and it, let's start with column one. This is looking at the main effect across the entire, you know, entire study area. Um, and what you see is that, you know, the price of rice is about, you know, 9,500 rupiah. Um, you see the voucher, it's positive, um, but very small and, and not significant. So we're not seeing an overall, you know, a, you know, a large increase um, in the overall price. Okay, so next we're going to look at, as I said, by the size of the supply shock, because we might expect that as the supply as more of the rice, um, you know, in the market is, you know, in kind, that's going to, you know, uh, subsidize, that's going to have a, a bigger effect on the private uh, uh, rice prices when you suddenly move from uh, trucking um, the in kind rice in to people buying it on the private market. And again, so here um, we've divided districts um, by whether or not you're above or below the median in terms of the share. Um, and then here is the 75th percentile. Again, it's not significant in both cases, although you do see a little bit of an increase from when you go from the 50th to the 75th percentile. Um, and it also, and again, is more, also more significant. So you had a p-value of 0.15. Okay. Okay. Third, um, we want to look at measures of isolation. And so we, um, you know, this is actually where the fact that we have this village level census is really exciting um, because it, um, because we have both characteristics of the village, whether or not you have a paved road or the road is not always passable. And we also have, um, you know, um, how the GPS, we know where your village is. And so we're able to look at how far you are from the district capital. So I'm going to first start with the, the measures of the quality of the road. So here is a road, um, you know, it's a non-paved road and the road's not always passable. Again, you know, the price of rice is about 9,500 here. Um, these are, the coefficients are positive, but not significant. So we're not really seeing that much there. The next, um, I'm looking at the, 
the time it takes to get to the district capital. Um, and so here, um, you know, again, the coefficient is a 155. So that's about a one and a half percent increase. Um, the p value is 0 0.2 to, you know, point, you know, point 0.2. Um, you know, as you get up to being at the 75th percentile, it goes up to about, um, you know, 340. That's about a three and a half percent increase, and it, it is significant. So just to give you a sense, I've then graphed out the treatment effects by the time to the district capital, and you do see it's upward sloping, and it gets to, you know, this is about in the 300s. So what does this mean? Um, you know, this basically, so it's, means um, in very remote areas, you're seeing a very small increase in the price of rice. Um, just to uh, back of the envelope, um, think about it in terms of a back of the envelope calculation. If I take the amount of rice people are buying in the private market and try to look at how much more expensive that rice is now to them, and I compare that additional cost relative to the benefits received, the benefits are still larger. Um, but again, it might be changing the amount you're receiving if you're in a very, very remote area. Okay. Um, I, oh, I, okay. I'm just going to go very, very quickly because I know I've gone out of time and I think also Ben had to go teach. <laughs> so he, he's probably no longer at the chat. Um, so uh, looking at, um, we talked about whether or not this is being driven by leakage. Um, we look at it and we try to, we try to compare so I know how many beneficiaries from the administrative data are supposed to receive a subsidy and I know how much they're supposed to receive. And then I can estimate this from the household survey and compare. And basically all of the effects I see are being driven by the change in who's receiving the program. I'm not seeing a change in the overall pie. So some of the subsidy still goes missing. I don't know where it is. And uh, that doesn't change as a result of the program. And then finally, you know, I think it's really important that we think about not just benefits, but also costs. Um, and this will be my last point because I know I've, I've run out of time. Um, so we consider the administrative costs of the program. For the in-kind, it's mostly storing and transporting the rice. So we got all the storage costs uh, from the logistics agency and for transporting the rice, since it's a, it's, it is an unfunded mandate, we use previous village surveys on the program that we had conducted to get an average price off of that. Um, for the vouchers, it's mostly the cost of renting the EDC machines, and then also the cost of printing and distributing the cards every few years. So if we look at the cost, the in-kind costs about 4% of the aid delivered, which is not actually that large. Um, the, the voucher is cheaper. So if you include every EDC machine and all the rent of all the EDC machines, it's about 2% of the, of the aid, the administrative costs are about 2% of the aid delivered. Um, now, of course, uh, and this was one of the questions earlier, some of these agents, a lot of these agents were there before and they were using the machines for other purposes. So why would you include them in as the cost of the program if they're being used for other things? And so if we only look at new agents um, and only include their costs for new agents, <coughs> the cost even falls further at 0.7%. Um, anyway, so, so I, I think I, I've, I've made my uh, main point that I think the the program, Rina, yeah. Before I let you conclude, just yeah. let me tell everybody. So, so after yeah. the conclusion, we'll open the up for, for uh, the open mic. Uh, so raise your hand if you want to ask a question so we know how to call on you. Uh, Emanuela, I'll show you, 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 you typing in a question. If you raise your hand, we can, you can ask it uh, orally. Go ahead. Uh, so what we're really finding, you know, this was such a, you know, for me, it was, um, it was just really amazing to see a value, uh, you know, uh, experiment built in to um, the large scale reform, um, really allowing us to understand, you know, we talk about these programs, you know, in theory, really understanding how they work in pra practice and, and how these reforms are uh, affecting the, the beneficiary households. And I think for me, one of the main takeaways is that the changes we're seeing as a result of the program really are coming from this improved administration of the program, the ability to better conform, conform with the, the original uh, targeting, theoretical targeting design. And you know, while that does have, you know, for example, it means that there are winners and losers, and you do see a little bit more um, exclusion error as well. But you're also seeing more, much more aid targeted uh, to poor households, which are affecting poverty. And I, I think that's, you know, uh, anyways, I, I find it a very interesting uh, result. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Rima. Uh, very interesting, which is also the comments uh, I've been seeing oh. in the Q and A. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 
the, so let me open the mic. So if uh, so people want to ask questions, please raise your hand. Um, I, had, I don't, oh, are you going to call up yeah, who's going to raise hand? I have, I have, yeah. So the, there's a question by Rido. I did that, I'm going to look. So uh, Rido, you need to, you should be able to talk now. Go ahead. But you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Either you need to unmute yourself, but you, you're allowed to talk. Okay, while, while we're sorting out the mechanics, there was a, an earlier question by Hope Mickelson um, on the intra household allocation here. So I guess the question is whether, we, in, in this context, you expect a difference between in kind versus uh, the debit card in terms of women having access to one versus the other uh, more often or not. Um, and I guess maybe there is a, I, I'll have a broader related question, which is on the inter household. Yeah. So, same thing, any, any kind of hypothesis or possibly from, you know, Ben was referring to the qualitative work on, on whether any inter-household uh, transfers are more or less likely with either mechanism. Oh, across, so, okay, so there's within household and then across household. Um, this is an interesting question. So for, um, for the first one, um, you know, it's hard for us to say um, because we don't fully have detail, like detailed data within the household. I should note that these programs are geared towards women. In the um, in the uh, um, in the original in kind program, women are supposed to pick it up. Oftentimes, you do see men picking up the rice just because these are heavy sacks of rice, and so it, so basically, anyone in the household can pick it up. For the um, for the debit cards, um, it is um, it is the name of the woman is written on the household. Now, of course, I think that makes it much more likely that a woman will pick it up. Of course, you know, maybe somebody could go with her debit card. There's talk about whether or not they should do biometrics or anything. But for the most part, I think it, it is geared uh, uh, towards uh, the woman in the household. So both programs are, I, but I don't have great data on to be able to really disentangle in our household because the treatment is all done at the household level. And the, um, the it is a household household survey. And, but I do think I, the, yeah, I don't. Yeah, but given that the I, I I can't say as much about the intra household across on transfers to other households. That's an interesting question. I have to go back. I think the I thought of it, and the data on transfers to other households was not. You know, again, we're using the SUSE now, so I couldn't design all the questions myself. I think there was less on that, but that's something I can try to think a little bit more about. Um, and in fact, the um. On a newer project I'm working on where we are looking at a different welfare program, I am collecting modules to look at these transfers more carefully. Um, and that, so even if I can't look at it here, I'll be able to look at it in another project. Yeah. Great. Uh, so there's a question by Ruben Ansuras. Uh, so Ruben, if you unmute yourself, you should be, yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Karen. Thanks a lot, Rima. This, this talk has been very, very fun. Um, I'm actually an MPAD on leave of absence this year. Oh, <laughs> one of my students. <laughs> it was really cool to, to get back into, into these this, um, ideas of development. Um, I, I, I'm curious uh, what, whether, did, whether you found any other effects that this program of vouchers had on the lives of people. Uh, for example, the fact that now women had a debit card, did they did it make it uh, more likely that they wanted or were interested in, in the financial sector or did they save more or something like that? So this is a really good question. So we're actually working on exactly this. So, um, so we're looking at two different things. One, whether or not we actually see people using um, uh, using the debit cards more are more likely to, to, to use their savings account. Um, and then we're also, one thing that we also thought was interesting is that if you're now collecting your, um, this, uh, um, you know, this uh, subsidy through an electronic means, there are other subsidy programs in the country, whether or not you're also more likely to collect that subsidy, there's spillovers to other welfare programs and you're more likely to adopt electronic. So right now we're working on, on that data right now to actually study those questions. And so I don't, I have, I have, I, I have some previews in my head of what I know the results are, but given that there are, you know, we're still working, um, I, again, I don't think we're going to see huge effects on financial inclusion, but we're still uh, working with both the Susanos data and um, trying to get more administrative data from the banks to try to answer those questions. 
And so hopefully maybe if you'll invite me again in another year or so, <laughs> I'll be able to give those results. <laughs> Rima, let me ask the, the follow-up question, and then Arthur, I'll pass the word to you. Um, but uh, the follow-up question, because Emanuela Galassos' was, the question yeah. was exactly uh, on, on a related question, on a related point. So she's asking whether you see, whether you're able to see budgetary allocations from other programs or subsidies targeted to the poor uh, in those districts or villages, uh, and any G responses in that terms. So that's exactly what we're looking at as well. Um, I can tell you again, you know, I wouldn't fully quote me on this because we've just started looking at this data that we're not seeing, um, we're not seeing uh, huge effects on the overall receipt of the other programs. Although you do see some for local government programs that you're a little bit more likely to receive it. Um, but again, we're still looking at that. What we're looking at, what we are trying to understand is also the, some of the other, like, for example, there's uh, other cash programs that you might get in, in cash. Um, uh, you might um, change how you receive the cash transfers. And so we're trying to understand if like, you're more likely to do that through a digital technology because you've learned now how to use the debit card and the digital technology. So that we're now trying to understand as well. But again, I wouldn't quote me on all of this because we're just starting to look at all of this data. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Arturo, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. And same thing, Rido, I know you still uh, haven't gotten your question, but you need to unmute yourself. So I'll give you the floor after Arturo. Arturo, go ahead. Uh, hi, Rima. Um, it was really fun to, to see your presentation. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering about a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, if you have any information in the uh, in the voucher places of what happened with the shops that didn't get uh, bank agents, if uh, they went out of business, what happened if there is some heterogeneity in terms of prices between them and those that have bank agents. Uh, and, and secondly, um, uh, sorry if I missed this because I missed communication at some point, but uh, do you know if something happened with the interest of people in the program? So after the voucher program came into place, were there more applications to the voucher programs? Do you know something about those applicants once it's, it's in place? Because I, correct me if I understood wrong, but it seemed that you had the 2017 data, mm -hmm. which is your, like your baseline PMT, and then the, the program came, right? Yeah, no, this is a great, these are both good questions. On the first one, we are starting to look a little bit more. So the World Bank did a, a survey on agents and we're trying to see what other data we have on businesses. Um, I do starting to see a little bit of an increase in um, more businesses in the voucher areas, but I'm trying to understand all of that. And so this is all connected to the financial inclusion work that we're trying to look at. Um, I, so right now I don't have answers for you, but that's something that we're definitely trying to understand as, as well to the best of our ability given our data constraints. On the second one, it's actually kind of interesting. So the way targeting is done in these programs is not very, it's not very done in very real time um, because getting information on households it, 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 in developing countries in real time is very challenging. And so in this program, all the targeting had been done in 2015. Um, that's when they did the PMT survey and that determines your your eligibility for the program. I think now um, they're also they're doing a new um, they're doing a, a new uh, the idea is that they're going to be doing a, the new targeting survey it should be happening around now. Um, again, it's going to be very complicated because COVID did two things. They um, they increased the amount people were receiving and then they also increased the number of people who are receiving the program by going further up the PMT list. So it's really changing. So it's going to be harder for me to just look at the, the treatment and control because um, the conditions change quite a bit. Although I think there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. things that happen there and trying to understand that and unpack that, I think is like really important to understand how these programs work during, um, you know, during recessions and bad times. And so. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let me see. Rido, did you want to come in? Mm -hmm. Technology not working. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Uh, Christian Zurpel, you also had your hand up, and I, uh, you should be allowed to talk. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Rima. Um, I was wondering about one aspect. So you said that, um, or what, what didn't really become clear to me was, uh, did the mistargeting, did, did that have like a regional aspect? So I, I could imagine that if you say, they took the data from 2015 areas of better social mobility. 
would have worse targeting than, let's say, very rural places where not much happens in terms of people's, you know, social ascent or descent? You know, we haven't looked at, um, we haven't, we looked at, I think at some point we looked at on and off Java, which is the big split for Indonesia. Mm -hmm. We were trying not to split it up too much because our data is at the, the district level and there's 105 districts. And so I didn't want to, but you're right that there's more I can do um, on the underlying, there's more I can do there. So let me think about that um, in terms of the underlying um, the targeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think we're kind of out of time, but I, I do have myself one somewhat yeah. silly question. But yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, you talked about the rise price changes and, and, and nothing there, but of course, the, the big result is on the X. And so mm -hmm. I guess the silly question is where are the X coming from? Uh, and the less silly question is, do you know anything about the price of the X? Oh, no, that's a good question. Actually, you know, it's funny. I was asking that question myself a few days ago. And so I think that's something I think. It's like slightly complicated because we're looking at egg protein and there's because the way the Indonesian government collects it is that they aggregate up there's like dug eggs and then there's chicken eggs and so it's egg protein so it's aggregated up across different egg types but I think let me go back and check what I have in terms of the, the price data for the eggs. That's a good question. Yeah okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rima. This was super interesting, as you could tell from the dynamics on all sides. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody, for um, uh, being with us. And we will see uh, those of you who are interested uh, in two weeks. Uh, and so Rima will be in her Zoom uh, meeting that, that uh, Gianmarco has posted uh, for you, if, for people that want to uh, talk to Rima uh, for a little bit more about this paper. Thank you, everybody. Take care.